What are we fighting for? From Kronstadt is Vestia, March 8th, 1921. After carrying out the October Revolution, the working class had hoped to achieve its emancipation, but the result was an even greater enslavement of the human personality. The power of the police and gendarme monarchy passed into the hands of the communist usurpers. Instead of giving the people freedom, instilled in them the constant fear of falling into the torture chambers of the Cheka, which in their horrors far exceed the gendarme administration of the czarist regime. The bayonets, bullets, and gruff commands of the Cheka Oprichniki, these are, these are what the working man of Soviet Russia has won after so much struggle and suffering. The glorious emblem of the worker's state, the sickle and hammer, has in fact been replaced by the communist authorities with the bayonet and barred window. For the sake of maintaining the calm and carefree life, of the new bureaucracy of communist commissars and functionaries. But most infamous and criminal of all is the moral servitude which the communists have inaugurated. They have laid their hands also on the inner world's world of the toilers, forcing them to think in the communist way. With the help of the bureaucratized trade unions, they have fastened the workers to their benches so that labor has become not a joy but a new form of slavery. To the protests of the peasants expressed in spontaneous uprisings and those of the workers whose living conditions have, been, have driven them out on strike, they answer with mass executions and bloodletting, in which they have not been surpassed even by the Tsar's generals. Russia of the toilers, the first to raise the red banner of labor's emancipation, is drenched in the blood of those martyred for the glory of communist domination. In this sea of blood, the communists are drowning all the great and glowing pledges and watchwords of the workers' revolution. The picture has been drawn more and more sharply, and now it is clear that the Russian Communist Party is not the defender of the toilers that it pretends to be. The interests of the working people are alien to it. Having gained power, it is afraid only of losing it, and therefore deems every means permissible. Slander, violence, deceit, murder, vengeance upon the families of the rebels. The long-suffering patience of the toilers is at an end. Here and there the land is lit up by the fires of insurrection in a struggle against oppression and violence. Strikes by the workers have flared up, but the Bolshevik Akrana agents have not been asleep and have taken every measure to forestall and suppress the inevitable third revolution. But it has come nevertheless, and it is being made by the hands of the toilers themselves. The generals of communism see clearly that it is the people who have risen, convinced that the ideas of socialism have been betrayed. Yet trembling for their skins and aware that there is no escape from the wrath of the workers, they still try, with the help of Oprichniki, Oprichniki to terrorize the rebels for, with prison, firing squads, and other atrocities. But life under the yoke of the communist dictatorship has become more terrible than death. The rebellious working people understand that there is no middle ground in the struggle against the communists and the new serfdom that they have erected. One must go on to the end. They give the appearance of making concessions. In Petrograd province, roadblock detachments have been removed and 10 million gold rubles have been allotted, to, allotted for the purchase of foodstuffs from abroad. But one must not be deceived, for behind this bait is concealed the iron hand of the master, the dictator, who aims to be repaid a hundredfold for his concessions once calm is restored. No, there can be no middle ground, victory or death. The example is being set by Red Kronstadt, menace of counter-revolutionaries of the right and of the left. Here the new revolutionary step forward has been taken. Here is raised the banner of rebellion against the three-year-old violence and oppression of communist rule, which has put in the shade the 300-year yoke of monarchism. Here in Kronstadt has been laid the first stone of the Third Revolution, striking the last fetters from the laboring masses and opening a broad new road for socialist creativity. 
This new revolution will also rouse the laboring masses of the East and of the West by serving as an example of the new socialist construction as opposed to the bureaucratic communist, quote, creativity. The laboring masses abroad will see with their own eyes that everything created here until now by the will of the workers and peasants was not socialism. Without a single shot, without a drop of blood, the first step has been taken. The toilers do not need blood. The toilers will shed it only at a moment of self-defense. In spite of all the outrageous acts of the communists, we have enough restraint to confine ourselves only to isolating them from public life so that their malicious and false agitation will not hinder our revolutionary work. The workers and peasants steadfastly march forward, leaving behind them the constituent assembly with its bourgeois regime and the dictatorship of the Communist Party with its Cheka and its state capitalism, whose hangman's noose encircles the necks of the laboring masses and threatens to strangle them to death. The present overturn at last gives the toilers the opportunity to have their freely elected Soviets, operating without the slightest force of party pressure, and to remake the bureaucratized trade unions into free associations of workers, peasants, and the laboring intelligentsia. At last the policeman's club of the communist autocracy has been broken. Um, this was sourced from the Unknown Revolution by Volin or Volin. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name.